every hobby or creative pursuit has its technical jargon, but with the possible exception of aviation or perhaps falconry, photography is surely the top dog. The words and phrases are necessary, of course, because they describe technical concepts, but that doesn't make it any bloody easier when you're just trying to get to grips with photography's fundamentals. The truth is that those phrases serve as a kind of gatekeeping, deterring those who might otherwise discover that the mystery of chromatic aberration matters far less than what you're actually photographing. So, in this video, I plan to demystify a few of the nerdier phrases and cast illuminating golden hour light on the doublespeak. Consider this your translation guide to speaking fluent photographer. All right, let's get into this. There's a few B's to get through for some reason, and we'll kick things off with one of my personal favorites. Back button focus. It's one of those techniques everyone says you should be using, but they never fully explain why. At its core, it's actually a really simple concept. It's simply using a separate button for autofocus activation. That's it. Traditionally, when you take a photograph, you hold your index finger halfway down on the shutter button and this makes the camera focus on whatever is under your focus reticle. Then you press the button fully to take the photo. All that back button focus does is spread those two steps, autofocus and shutter, across two buttons instead of one. So you use one button to focus and then a different button to activate the shutter and take the photo. Now, you may be wondering, why is this technique worth using? Surely, it's more convenient to have both steps combined in one button. No, it really isn't, and I'll give you a good reason for starters. Fat fingers. How many times have you gone to half press that button and taken a load of wonky shots instead, or missed your focus completely. Back button focus also makes it ridiculously easy to nail your composition because you get your focus correct, and then you can move the camera, or indeed your entire body, and then hit the shutter button when you're sure it looks great. If you shoot wildlife, then back button focus is awesome because you can get the animal in focus and take your shot at the right moment without getting a debilitating cramp holding that bloody button halfway down. At its core, photography is all about handling two main things, dealing with varying levels of light and the distortion that comes with viewing that light. Our eyes distort light, glasses distort light, the atmosphere distorts light, and yes, Lenses distort light. The lenses with the least amount of distortion tend to be the ones that most closely mimic our own eyes, such as the old faithful 50mm nifty 50. The lenses with the most amount of distortion tend to be the ones doing stuff our eyes cannot, super wide or zoom. In order to build lenses in the super wide or zoom categories, you have to deal with a very specific kind of curvature called barrel distortion. This is the optical effect seen in lenses where straight lines get curved towards the edges of the frame. Imagine stretching a picture around a ball. The bit in the center will appear fairly normal, but it will look distorted towards those outer edges. There's a complex array of individual bits of glass in a lens that are designed to counter this distortion, but they can't work miracles. If you shoot with an ultra-wide lens or a telephoto lens at its widest, i.e. 24 or 70 at 24, then you'll want to ensure your raw editor does lens correction because it can fix it. 
Much of what we do in digital photography is attempting to make up for the technical limitations of sensors. When the technology first came along, those sensors were much less capable, able to display only 256 shades of red, green, or blue. This was called 8-bit because there were eight bits of data per red, green, or blue channel. And this added up to a color palette of 16.7 million colors. When the RAW format came along in the early 2000s, camera manufacturers transitioned to 12-bit and then 14-bit sensors, which are capable of recording for more subtle shades of light. In fact, the 14-bit sensors used in most decent digital cameras these days can record 4.39 trillion shades of color, or gray if you're from the UK like me, 16,384 shades of gray. That's the actual number, incidentally. There are two main parts of a photograph, the subject or subjects and the background. Generally speaking, all photographers strive to keep the subject in focus that's Photography 101, friends. But it often doesn't matter at all if the background is out of focus and, in fact, is a desirable outcome when shooting something like portraits. Bokeh is a Japanese word that roughly translates to blur or haze and is used to describe the eye-pleasing qualities of those lovely out-of-focus backgrounds. Some lens and camera combinations do a better job of delivering soft and dreamy backgrounds, and for these reasons are sought after by photographers. Bracketing is taking a sequence of photographs for the specific purpose of merging them during post-processing. Camera sensors have come a bloody long way, but there are still plenty of situations in which you cannot capture the full dynamic range of light in a single exposure. And so what you do is shoot an underexposed shot, a correctly exposed shot, and an overexposed shot, and then you merge them in HDR or exposure blending software. You can also use bracketed shots for focus stacking so that your image is completely sharp from front to back. There is a third use case too. I shoot literally everything bracketed because it means I don't have to think about whether to under or over expose a shot for artistic purposes. I can simply decide afterwards when I'm picking through my keepers in a Lightroom. Here's a phrase that is used in a slightly bitchy manner by the sort of photographers who look down on kit lenses and filters that aren't made by Lee. It's called chimping. Chimping is when you take a shot and then immediately check it out on the LCD screen on your camera. The constant bobbing up and down of the head to look at the photos on the screen is supposed to look like a chimp. Look, I didn't invent the phrase. Take it up with the management. Here's a phrase you should never use on a first date, unless you're looking for an excuse to bail. Chromatic aberration. The reasons for this are highly technical, and I'd be lying if I said I fully understand them, but it basically boils down to a lens's difficulty in bending light uniformly. It makes its presence known at the borders of contrasty areas of your photograph and you will know it by its telltale green or purple halos surrounding those contrasty areas. Good raw editors such as Capture One Photo Lab or Lightroom all include tools to minimize chromatic aberration and personally speaking I always leave those tools on by default. If you've ever redecorated then you probably paid a visit to a hardware store and spent delightful hour or two agonizing over paint swatches and just when you pick one and you're marching confidently down the aisle with a color swatch in hand you realize there's a very slightly different range of colors in an alternative paint manufacturer's swatch book color spaces are the photographic equivalent of those color collections from paint manufacturers they're collections or containers if you prefer of colors 
and they're important because they're designed for very specific use cases. The color space you're undoubtedly most familiar with is sRGB because it's great for general purpose use and delivers consistent colors on a huge variety of devices. But if you want a wider and therefore more subtle range of colors, then you'll need something like Pro Photo RGB, which basically has the entire color range, or Adobe RGB, which is the preferred color space for many print labs. Camera sensors are made up of a massive number of pixels, each of which is assigned to capture just one of the three primary colors, red, green, and blue. The fact that the pixels are specialized means that the camera is not recording the other two primary colors at that pixel location, so there are some gaps in the data set. And demosaicing is the code that fills in the gaps in that raw image, basically guessing at what should be there by looking at the pixels around it. It's the very core of post-processing, and it's why I'm always banging on about it in my raw editor reviews, because some demosaicing algorithms are vastly superior to others. Depth of field has nothing to do with the longitudinal dimensions of paddocks. Instead, it refers to image sharpness. The depth of field of a photograph is that range which is in focus and which therefore appears nice and sharp. Depth of field varies according to aperture, focal length and distance to the subject. Wide lenses have a much deeper depth of field than telephotos and smaller apertures such as f16 have deeper depth of field than wider apertures such as f2. Landscape photographers usually prefer a nice deep depth of field so that as much of the image as possible is nice and sharp. But you can utilize shallow depth of field for artistic purposes, which is one of my favorite styles of photography. You've heard of the Bermuda Triangle. You've heard of a love triangle. Have you ever heard of the exposure triangle? This is a handy way of wrapping your brain around the relationship between aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, which in turn enables you to shoot photographs in manual mode should the mood take you. The gist of this one is that all three of the aforementioned camera settings enable you to control the amount of light hitting the sensor. By increasing or decreasing a setting on one side of that triangle, you can offset the others in order to create balance and to therefore take a properly exposed photograph. For instance, if you choose a smaller aperture, because you want everything sharp, then you can increase the ISO or take a longer exposure to compensate. All lenses are classified according to their focal lengths. This being the distance from the lens to the sensor. So in a 10 millimeter lens, there's just one centimeter separating that lens from the sensor, which in turn means you get a very wide view. Prime lenses have just one focal length, or a 50 millimeter or 85 millimeter, while telephoto lenses have two, the shortest and longest focal lengths that lens is capable of shooting. Here's one that sounds like some kind of nebulous arty phrase, but can actually be precisely defined. Golden hour. This is the period immediately after sunrise or just before sunset when the light is at its softest and most dappled. At that time of the day, the sun is at its most aggressive angle to the earth, meaning the light has to travel much further and is cast over a wider area. The bottom line is this, you usually get the best light of the day from sunrise to 30 minutes after, and for 30 minutes leading up to sunset. I mean, yeah, it sounds like something Han Solo might have said sarcastically to Chewbacca on the flight deck of the Millennium Falcon as he was asking for a hydro spanner so they could jump to light speed, but hyperfocal distance has nothing to do with interplanetary space jumps and everything to do with the force, uh, no, not the force, the focus. Hyperfocal distance is a clever way of ensuring you get optimum sharpness consistently in your photos. It's that point you need to pre-focus on that delivers the maximum depth of field 
see above for your photograph. The distance of that spot from you and your camera depends on the focal length of your lens, the aperture you're using, and something that is spectacularly, ironically called the circle of confusion. Now, there's an equation you can use to work out optimum hyperfocal distances and therefore end the Federation's trade blockade of Naboo. But sod that for a game of soldiers. Just use an app. I recommend Photo Pills, which has a cool feature for calculating the sweet spot for any camera aperture and focal length. By way of example, the hyperfocal distance on my X-T4 with the super wide at 10 mil and an aperture at F8 is 0.65 meters in front of me. While on my 100 to 400 at 400 mil and F5.6, the hyperfocal distance is 1.4 kilometers. Lenses are not perfect objects that work flawlessly all the time. So they all have idiosyncrasies. Lens breathing is one of those idiosyncrasies, though it's honestly more of an issue if you're shooting video and doing professional focus pulls. It's an optical phenomenon that occurs when the focal length of a lens appears to change as you adjust its focus. This means the image appears to zoom in or zoom out very slightly even though you're not touching the zoom setting. On the face of it, noise sounds like something you want to get rid of, but this is photography and nothing is ever that clear cut. There are two kinds of noise, luminance and color. The latter being far less desirable than the former. Color noise is when you get random patches of color in your photograph where they shouldn't be, usually as a result of using a high ISO. Luminous noise, on the other hand, is random variations in brightness across an image that resembles the grain you get in traditional darkroom prints. Having a little bit of luminous noise in a photograph is quite a desirable outcome, but you'll definitely want to deal with the colour noise. It sounds like something you might do in a theatre school, but actually vignetting is a kind of Schrodinger's box phenomenon. This is because it's something that good raw editing software will remove in the lens correction module because it's a flaw. But at the same time, you can add it back because it enhances the photo. I know, right? Photography, funny old game. Anyway, vignetting is, of course, the darkening of the corners of an image compared to the center. Some lenses at some focal lengths have fairly noticeable natural vignettes and Lightroom Photolab and Capture One can get rid of them. But quite often, accentuating center contrast by adding a vignette in post-processing is a desirable outcome. And so you can add one back in. And that's just a few of the jargony photographic terms and phrases you may have encountered. Are there any good ones you've thought of that I left out? Let me know in the comments section below and I might just do a part two. If you enjoyed this content or got value from it or both, hopefully, then please do hit the like button and consider subscribing for more photo, video and drone related content from me. Till next time guys, ta-ta.